these traps that were set out there, they put four around the carcass and then one on the highest point of ground nearby in its field. Over the next two or three days, the coyote came back and they brushed off the debris off the, the, the trap to expose it. They knew it was there and they wouldn't go anywhere near it. Down at uh, Westfield, uh, there's, a, there's a Barnes Airport, gave us a call. Same thing about coyotes. They have a commuter plane that goes out about 5.30 in the morning. And running down the runway, these coyotes are playing around the edge of the runway, and they didn't want to have uh, an accident between this computer, this computer plane going out. So we set up one of these large Havahard style traps, a box trap, made out of wire, and big enough for an animal that size to go into. And we put a false cage in the back and put a live pheasant in there, figuring that would be a, a good attraction because pheasants are in the area, and he might have had that in his food chain. And we set it up there, set two of them up. And over the next couple of days, the coyotes would walk all around this thing, but they wouldn't go into it. So they have a built-in system that uh, they're very, very sharp about these things. And they're survivors, that's all I can say. Uh, there's, there's not many means at hand that you can use to control. In the West, they tried shooting from aircraft, poison bait and all these kind of things. And this poison bait is something that just goes on and on and on. If an animal feeds on the carcass has been poisoned and they have residual effects. A cat will, will, uh, will uh, may die from a bird that, that, that it ate that fed on that same carcass. So it's pretty hot stuff when you get involved with poisons. Right, uh, that's interesting because uh, my grandmother, she has a 400 acre ranch in, in Fowler, Kansas, and uh, coyotes are um, the major. They, they had mountain lions, but they're long, long gone now because of the ranching. But, Coyote to the major predator, and um, they're they're quite a, they, they're quite a problem because they are so sneaky, and the only effective way that the farmers, or the, the cattle ranchers in those regions that dealt with them, is to wipe out their food supply, to go to the prairie dogs and to poison the prairie dogs, but it's sort of like a double edge because once they wipe out the prairie dogs with poison, the coyotes are so adaptable that they can switch over to other foods. Like Food sources like digging in garbage cans. They're okay. so adaptable, we, we totally underestimate their ability. It seems that the eastern version is just as intelligent. They'll eat insects when, when uh, grasshoppers, when they're available. Frogs, uh, uh, like you say, garbage. House cats, too. They'll, they'll take a house cat. Uh, these kind of things. There was one record in California of a little baby girl that was killed by coyotes because it came in on the back porch. Now, when people start developing into the countryside and putting houses everywhere, looking to force out the animal, the animal becomes urbanized and learns how to live in a society. The gray squirrel, the, the, the uh, uh, raccoon, skunks, possum, all of these now become like urban animals. They're living around the cities. Uh, Sir? Herman, could you say a little about the eco restoration program? You're reading my mind because I was just about to talk about that too. <laughs> Some, or 80, I think 81 or 82, I, I can't keep track of time because I've been out for so long, but it's probably uh, eight years ago, they started to restore the bald eagle to Massachusetts. Uh, they picked the Quabbin Reservoir because it's the most remote area, and of course eagles require remoteness. And they had uh, a pair of eagles, young birds taken out of a nest in the wild, brought down here and reestablished to imprint into the quabba. By imprinting, I mean you start with a population like we did with the, with the salmon, bring the young ones in, and set them up into a place here, and hopefully they'll accept this as their home territory. With the first two birds that they had, they came out of Minnesota, northern Minnesota. That was Ross and Betsy. When they were released, they were put, put transmitters on them so you could follow their movements until they made their first molt. These transmitters are sold to the tail with some monofilament fish line, and two things are going to happen. Either the sun's going to run off that line after a period of time, or when they molt their feathers, they're going to drop the transmitter. And they have uh, leg, mag leg, leg bands and, and wing, wing tags. Now, when they first released, uh, Betsy took off and ended up in western Ontario, uh, probably within 500 miles of where they came from. But Ross has been back every single year since. Now, we've had succeeding nesting. We started with two, went to four to six, and now we're about to eight. And each year, the last two or three years, Nova Scotia has provided us with eight birds. They have a, a naturalist up there. Uh, we'll, set, we'll 
scout areas where there are eagle nests and physically go out and uh, climb a tree and take one bird out of a multiple bird nest. By that I mean if there are two birds in a nest, they wouldn't rob the entire nest, they'll just take one of them, leaving one for the mother bird to continue to raise on her own. And, so, and collectively take birds from, like in this case, eight different nests. And they've flown back to Poivin and put in this tower. And they have a double-decker tower that has four artificial nests in it. Two birds to a nest. Uh, Bill Davis has been with us the last couple of years on this project, and he bunks right there with them for the duration of time that they're in the nest. On a daily basis, someone is there, feeds them accordingly. And they've got a little bit more sophisticated with the program over the years. They have scales that are set up as digital scales. When, when a bird lands on a perch, they take his weight immediately, and his food intake is, is uh, geared to how his development is. The more he weighs, the more weight they feed, the more fish you have to feed him. Fish being their primary source of food. And they also mix in uh, roadkill deer and so forth. So while they're there uh, and developing, by Bill's observation, when it comes time for the bird to be released, they'll pick a release date. And the birds, again, are fitted with transmitters and tags and the whole thing, and then released. And then they follow them for the rest of the summer. Every year, uh, in every state of the Union that has eagles, they do a physical count. In Massachusetts, uh, the 9th of January, this last couple of years, it's been falling on the 9th both times, uh, they have a bunch of volunteers out here. Now, at Quabbin, they may have 12 or 15 different sites where they, where they see, you know, look for birds from. The most obvious being the lookout at, uh, at Quabbin, you know, the, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, <coughs> off Windsor Dam, there's a, yes. there's a lookout over there. The summit. Oh, yeah, the summit. Up near the summit, down <coughs> on the next corner. Where you, it's the old Enfield lookout, looking down the old Enfield village. Uh, they'll have people set up there even this time of year with scopes. And if you happen to be over there and yeah. see somebody set up with a scope, just ask them what's going on. They'd be glad to let you look through the scope or whatever. It's funny because I was just there like Sunday and there was millions of them all over the place and they had to look how I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, on this one particular day, though, they do a physical count, as I said. And they have a form that they set up. And each person who's on a station, if sees a bird, if he sees a bird at all, writes down the location time and a direction of flight. Let's say you're down at gate eight, and somebody's up at Mount Ram, three or four miles above you, and a bird flies by you at 10.15 in the morning and headed in an orderly direction. Chances are somebody else is going to see that same bird. So when he fills out his card, he might have a bird coming from the south at 10.28 or whatever it might be, and uh, make the same recording. At the end of the time, these papers are brought in, and they send them to the Patuxent, Maryland, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service lab down there. And they feed these into a computer program. And the computer takes out the double sightings. It tells you how many birds had to be there to have this, this amount of sightings, depending on the number of people. <coughs> As a comparison check, they've used a helicopter to fly the same territory, up one side and down the other and all the islands, in about an hour and a half's time. And they count from the air, looking down on the, on the ice with a white background and a bird will flush when he hears the helicopter get close, they get a good view. Maybe the shadow first, then the bird, and they get a good count of what's there. So it's something like 44 birds uh, were seen this year, one golden eagle, uh, and about half and half were, were immature. Last year, uh, they saw the first beginnings of three different nests being built in Quabbin. Ross is one of them, and he's hooked up with another release bird from about a two year later release, I think it was 80, 83 or 85, so that uh, he has a mate now. And it's common for them to start their nest, uh, even though they may not be quite mature enough to have, uh, just to have eggs of their own. Once an eagle selects the next nest site, they keep it year after year, and they keep building to it. In uh, some of the countries like Minnesota, where they've had eagles for years, they've taken a tree apart to get an idea of what this nest consists of and found 2,000 pounds of material in the top of some of these giant trees. Just continue adds to it. Branches as big as your arm. And they have found the beginnings of three different nests, and they <coughs> hope to have this summer uh, perhaps the first nesting eagle in the last 50 years here in Massachusetts. And we hope that Ross will be one of them. So that's a restoration program that you probably don't hear too much about. They were doing the same thing with the peregrine falcons. Now, they historically nested here uh, 
many years ago at some of these cliff sites. Mount Tom was one of them. There's a couple of places around Irving, some places in the Berkshire where they, they nest on these sheer cliff sites. Um, they've been gone for quite a while. So they have another program <coughs> again with the Peregrine Falcon. And uh, Cornell University has a captive breeding program where they have about 140 birds or so. And they are, are laying eggs and, and hatching out young birds. And they make these young birds available to the different states in the Northeast here for their restoration programs. On the federal building in Boston, they have this five foot granite ledge around the top and they made up a, a box arrangement up on top of this uh, big, big building. And they brought in six of these young birds. Across the, across the street, there was an office building that gave our people a, a, a viewing platform for one of, the, uh, one of the floors that wasn't being used on the 22nd floor. And they could look across and see this box up there on a daily basis. And one of the, one of the secrets to this whole thing about feeding these captive birds is that they don't want to have a, a direct chain between the bird or the animal and, and human. So you feed them from behind a petition or something like that, or through one-way glass where you see what's going on, but they can't see you. And after the birds again are released, Boston has the buildings now that represent the cliffs and the, the pigeons that are all over town as their ready food supply. So with two years of, on this program in Boston, they've now saturated Boston with, with the uh, peregrines because they are territorial. And we find birds from one year beating up on the birds from the next year, which means is uh, now you're going to have to start moving out because uh, uh, even though Boston's a large city, uh, it don't take too many peregrines to, to claim territory down there. So uh, I believe UMass was used last year on one of the buildings up there. And I don't know exactly where that program is going just yet, but they have got birds from Canada down here in Springfield that you've heard them probably on the Monarch building. Uh, where a bird was seen down there on the ledge, and they uh, read the band numbers, and it came from one of the birds that was uh, released in Canada. Canada. Uh, so many, many things are happening as far as uh, these research projects are concerned, and a, a lot of it has to do with, with developing a special system that will work for that particular species. On the uh, Atlantic salmon restoration, of course, we've read a great deal of recent in recent months because the numbers of salmon have not been up to what have been hoped for. Do you have any thoughts well, on that? Or this is another system where, uh, again, for 200 years there weren't any Atlantic salmon here. Now, the Atlantic salmon uh, that we have in the Connecticut River is the same kind of a fish that you might see up in New Brunswick, same Atlantic salmon. And they don't die after spawning like the western variety do. When they built the dams, the power dams on the Connecticut River in the 1700s, uh, what it physically did was block these salmon from returning to their headwaters for spawning. So what they've actually did was wiped out that Connecticut River Atlantic salmon strain. Even though you had Connecticut, uh, these Atlantic salmon, let's say in New Brunswick, uh, parts of maybe New Hampshire, uh, they were just forced away from the Connecticut River system, and you lost that homing instinct from that particular species. This maybe you might want to call it a subspecies. It was discovered that every known Atlantic salmon in the world, when they go to the, go to the ocean, they spend about four years in, in uh, salt water. And they gravitate to the west coast of Greenland. There's a large, expansive ocean up there. The European fish from, from uh, Sweden and uh, Spain and all these European countries that have uh, Atlantic salmon waters all end up off the west coast of Greenland. The commercial fishermen, the Danes being one of them, uh, spent a lot of time out there collecting salmon. What they tried to do was to limit the take of salmon by all these nine uh, international nations out there that in the high seas. And they ended up with a, a, a ban on some of the Danish products to get them to come around so they finally signed the same compact. So now they have to limit the amount of uh, fish that are taken. We took uh, Canadian salmon, Atlantic salmon, and uh, there were a couple of different varieties they brought down here. And they put them into what's called a stock out pool. This is a, like if you can a distant vision, a swimming pool, back <coughs> swimming pool, with water coming in and going out from the river, or one of the tributaries to the river, and put these fish in there. They come from a, a par to uh, a smolt in their normal development. 
When they smultify, they change bodily appearance. They become silvery looking. They don't have the, the bar markings that a brook drop might have. And then when it's deemed that they're looking to migrate on their own, they just pull out the, the springs and the fish takes off, goes down into the river, and starts a downstream migration towards salt water. And by imprinting, maybe it's through smell or something like that, they, we hope they accept us as their home territory. So these fish would leave, go to salt water, and spend three or four years, and then come back as adults. Before they left, a lot of these young fish were tagged with a little bit of a, like a paper clip right in the middle of the nose here. And when they come back, they run a metal detector over them. It's not really what you consider a metal detector like you have today, but this device will pick up that tag and you can tell whether it's one of your own fish or not. So what we've actually done was created a new strain of the Connecticut River salmon. These fish that are now being born here leave and come back. So your success of the program is based on a lot of different variables here. First of all, is it's a survival. If you put in 100,000 smolts, and only one or two percent comes back, you see you have a, a very, very low rate of turnover. If you put in 500,000, it's five times greater. You put in 100 times greater, it's the same situation. Uh, conditions four years from now are hard to, hard to dictate. So if you set up uh, some of the streams, they're now trying even, even with the fry, is to put fry in the streams to develop on their own and leave on their own to sort of strengthen this whole thing. Uh, a lot depends on what happens in the ocean when they get out there, pollution being another major major problem. So we still don't know where we're at exactly, and they're still working with the system, but they do have the Atlantic salmon coming back, and there are a few being uh, seen uh, at the Holyoke lift. We, we have people who monitor the lift, and when a salmon comes through, it comes up as far as the Holyoke Dam, and they can't go beyond that. They have a crowder system where fish come into a sluiceway, gate drops down, slides forward, and all those fish come into a large bucket, brought up and dumped <coughs> into a sluiceway. They stand by a viewing window, and people sit there counting fish as they go by. It might be Atlantic Shad, could be uh, uh, Striped Bass, or a few of those may come up this far. And whatever they might, might be seeing uh, is counted on the way by this viewing screen. When a salmon shows up, they just touch a couple little valves, and bars come down, and, and bar any more movement at that point in time. Then they can lower the water, get in there and slide this fish into a canvas bag, like a suitcase or something, bring it up and drop it into a uh, holding station waiting for a truck to come by and pick them up and bring them to a hatchery. So that's how that system works. They artificially take the eggs in, in the fall of the year and then they're turned back into the system through either a, a par or smoke release or uh, yeah. even to the point of uh, release as fry in the feeder streams. So it's an ongoing thing. I, I think they're a long way from uh, what you might consider success. But uh, we do have an Atlantic salmon now that's, that is uh, considered native to the Connecticut River. <coughs> While we're on fish, uh, there's another species in the Connecticut River that you may not know too much about. It's fully protected as a short nose sturgeon. Now, they've done some studies on that, uh, again, through grad students at UMass and a few years ago. Now, here is another sort of an odd creature. I guess it might be a holdover from prehistoric times, the way it's developing is. It takes a long time to reach maturity. And they have found that the short note sturgeon does not, the sturgeon does not mature until it's 17 years old, before it can lay eggs at all. It have a life, life expectancy of 35 years. So you can see there's a real slow turnover here in this population. At any given time, there could be 2,000 sturgeon between the Holyoke Dam, let's say, and Long Island Sound. Now, those fish that are mature enough that might spawn next spring will stay in the river over the, over the winter. You might have 500 fish there now that are uh, both male and female adults that might be looking to spawn come spring. The other 1,500 would have migrated back to Long Island Sound for the winter. So. Uh, you, you'll find that these fish are put on for full protection. Anybody takes one, they have to release it and put it back. There are a few sturgeon above the, the, uh, the dam as well. Uh, but it goes back to what I said before about each species has its own particular requirements. I, I 
thought your, your comment on the, uh, the salmon restoration of our not knowing what's happening in the ocean was, was a good one. Uh, the fact that we could be doing everything humanly possible uh, at this end to restore that fish and having absolutely no control over pollution, overfishing, and that sort of thing that's going on. That's right. When you figure that there's millions, millions and millions of, of tons of salmon in the ocean, we're only dealing with a real small percentage that are the, the Atlantic salmon that come to the Connecticut River system. And so hopefully it's like a straw in a, in a needle in a haystack. We're trying to find that needle to, to bring it back here to the Connecticut River system. We have another river that Atlantic salmon are now um, coming to is a Merrimack, which would be a substrate of the same fish. They come down and, and uh, uh, utilize the Merrimack River. It might be interesting to note that all these salmon, let's say there's a massive amount there uh, off the west coast of Greenland. When it comes time to spawn, they all head south to their own territories. The European fish take a left-hand turn and head along to the European coastline. And those along the uh, North American <coughs> continent just keep bumping along on their way down. The large, one of the largest streams in, in uh, New Brunswick might be the Miramichi. Everybody's heard of the Miramichi River. So all the fish that are going to go to the Miramichi head up that section of water, and they take with them the Renous fish, <coughs> the Dungarvan fish, and any other, like the Canes or these other uh, streams that uh, follow into, into the Renous. When they come up river, the first stream you find is the Renous, and those fish will peel off and go up to their headwaters. And they might take with them the Dungarvan fish, and when they get to the Dungarvan, they branch off. So they all head back to their headwaters. It's like having the fingers of your hand, this being the main body, and all these feeder streams, and all these salmon go back to the headwaters of their own particular stream. So uh, it's quite unusual when you understand that you might wipe out, let's say, uh, a strain in the Renous, yet still have fish come to the Miramichi. I wanted to ask, uh, in your uh, wildlife management programs uh, over time, there's no overtime. <laughs> no Excuse overtime. Me. Excuse me. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> the state won't allow it. Uh, no, I, I, I was curious as to uh, have you seen either uh, human uh, development activities and or uh, environmental pollution in recent years impacting in any significant way that's apparent in terms of restoring species or managing well, we have fish kill reports every year, and we're gearing up for that this coming season by having kids together where we can go out and try to do an immediate sampling. Uh, the last couple I was involved with myself have been the West Hill River, where the plant down there, or, 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 was it Orinoco Mills? The paper paper mill, paper. Strathmore. They had a spill down there. It always happens at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon when they clear the pipes, I guess. But anyway, uh, there'll be a fish kill. And the way things develop there, we've called the DEQE people to come in, try to make get an assessment. If we can, get some water samples to see what the, what the chemical is. This last one, they they identified that it was theirs, their, their mistake. Somebody turned a valve and something happened and they, they killed some fish in the, in the river. What can be done now is there's laws that say that if they cause a fish kill, we can assess them three times the damage. So if we find that, uh, let's say you had 500 pounds of trout, might have been lost. Well, we can replace trout. We can't do much with the, with the others. But as far as the trout are concerned, we can assess them triple damages. So they purchased uh, fish from a private concern. And the last one, I think they, they uh, uh, brought in 2,000 trout to uh, stock an area. We went along with the, uh, the individual, and they provided their people which, with jackets and ties and hip boots out there to, to release fish. So. Uh, that can happen when, when you get there soon enough to be able to identify who it is. If you deal with honorable people, no problem. It's the midnight dumpers that you have a problem with. Somebody go along and, and either dump a load off a truck or whatever. These things could, <coughs> could cause a problem. And depending on what the material is, it might be widespread. Now, as far as the fur-bearing animals and what have you, uh, as far as the fact that Massachusetts agriculture really has declined significantly in recent years. We've had 
we've had reforestation, have we not? And yes. has that, has that, <coughs> has the effect of that been significant enough that even with all the development we're having, the, the range and habitat has, uh, for these animals has actually increased despite development? Would you say that's true? It's and not less? entirely so. Some of, it, some of it might be on the agricultural practices themselves. Years ago when I was a kid, everything was done by hand. And you left hedgerows and these kind of things. Uh, you always had pheasants using these areas. Mm -hmm. Now with the clean farming of today, when, when the, the uh, farming is now an agribusiness, they get out there and they, they do all this clean farming, there's not much left. So if you get a heavy snow cover, the uh, food that might have been available would not be. So you might have a difference as far as the survival on a particular season is concerned. Uh, with the fur bearers and our current system here, we uh, have a good handle on exactly what's happening. Now, beaver, otter, fisher, coyote, uh, bobcat have to be brought to us for tagging purposes. So we know exactly what's coming out. We know that there's probably 1,800 beaver taken a year. We know that maybe uh, 25 to 35 bobcat a year. When it gets to be 50, we would shut the season down. We know there's about 160 fisher, about 40 coyote. So we know what's happening with these. Now the people who buy furs, that would be a fur dealer, has to also send in reports, even though you're not tagging muskrats. We know that there's probably 60 to 70,000 muskrats sold a year. We know there's probably 55 to 60,000 raccoon a year. So we have an idea of what's happening as far as the fur bearer populations are concerned. Uh, your question is hard to answer when, when we don't know what's happening in a, in a particular area. Animals being so adaptable that they, they're forced out of move. You might have a problem when, uh, in the case of a beaver who has specific needs, he needs a weapon for surviving. When a beaver sets up a colony, he may stay there for 10 years. Once the available food supply is gone, that's the trees and shrubs that he uses for his dam and for his house and for his food supply, if it's pretty well depleted, they'll move off on their own. And then that dam will deteriorate, water will drop out of it, it'll come back to brush, and 10 years later another beaver will come in. But there's only so many weapons. We're at a point now where we don't have too many places left where you can take a nuisance complaint, trap the animal, and bring it back and release it somewhere. Because where are you going to release it? If there's already beaver there, you bring in a stranger, you're going to have a problem between those two. They're going to, well, they're going to fight, and one's going to drive the other one out. It's usually the stranger that's ganged up on by the, the resident people that are there, even though they may have, let's say, uh, one beaver colony could have the, the father and mother, last year's young and this year's young. So the last year's young are the ones that move out every second year. So you're going to have anywhere from two to seven beaver in a colony. You bring in a stranger and he's got immediate competition. So we're at a point now where if it's a problem for you and they have to go from your place, we may just have to just destroy that animal. Would you like to comment on the poaching ring that uh, hit those people? Yeah, that was, uh, that was something that was uh, a long way coming. I knew something was in the wind. Uh, they, they were working on it for some time. Two and a half years they had undercover people with that group. With that group. One guy from Massachusetts and, and one guy from Connecticut. The guy from Connecticut was physically searched one day with a gun to his, to his ear. They thought he was uh, going to spy on him or whatever. They didn't come up with any microphones, so uh, he was left alone. They got videotapes of some of the things that they did. When uh, when they were finally taken, they had like three to four hundred bear hunters.